Hello everyone, welcome back to Code with Italians. Today we will be continuing our, I guess, improvised mini series on graphics and animation stuff, uh, which you're gonna see is gonna continue over the next uh, month as well. We have some very interesting news for you coming up. I'm super excited about it. Uh, today we have our best troll <laughs> with us. Hi, Mark. So Mark, Tell us why we are going to be trolling you today for a change. <laughs> be afraid. Be very afraid. I'm going to be coding. So uh, I'm going to uh, be the one breaking shit, and Seb's going to be the one trolling me for it. Um, I mean, I'm sure I'm going to be breaking shit as well, even though if I'm not going to be coding, I'll find a way. You know, it's like Jurassic Park. Life always finds a way. <laughs> Seb, Seb as well. Yeah. Seb as well. So, Mark, welcome. Welcome, welcome. Lovely to be here. Um, before we start, if you don't mind, a few weeks ago, somebody, and with somebody I mean Mark, uh, pointed out that uh, Spike was missing a, a pizza toy. <laughs> so, I actually looked it up on Amazon and I found this thing uh, that was supposed to be larger as, as a starter <laughs> but that's a classic right uh, it was supposed to be bigger and also dog resistant so it took spike like probably 15 seconds to start ripping <laughs> into pieces so i had to take it away because i was like okay it won't make it to tomorrow stream so so now spike you can spike yeah echo echo so now you can enjoy the pizza thing. Uh, you can enjoy Spike, and <laughs> Spike is gonna is gonna eat pizza live uh, with us as long as the the thing, I mean, survives. It's also supposed to be. It's also supposed to be squeaky. So it's uh, gonna be interesting. Anyway, oh, uh, that's not gonna be a problem at all during the stream. <laughs> no, 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 no. I am, I confide. I, I, I trust in the machine learning that you know noise canceling kind of thing. Um, <laughs> anyway, the dog is already gone with the with the toy. So ciao. <laughs> um, uh, so this is it. This is the uh, the announcement for from the the dog uh, part of the world. Uh, if if you want, Sebastiano, we can we can start with the usual uh, warm up for the, the people in the in the chat. Um, I'm wearing the Spike t-shirt. Uh, the Spike t-shirt was uh, designed by uh, Virginia Poltrak, um, previously at Google, designing the Android Studio splash screens and like a, a, other shit tons of stuff. So if you want to get the t-shirt, you can find it on, uh, on our store um, and the link is in the chat. Um, we also have, of course, we have the Angry Pizza uh, T-shirt. Uh, you you saw that uh, Sebastiano was wearing it at some conference, I guess. Uh, I, I was I was actually uh, wearing the Spike one. Mm, nice, but yeah, Mark, that's the Mark. Has that's the, the old the school Angry one. <laughs> yeah, he <laughs> the has old school the, one. The OG. It has the OG Angry Pizza T-shirt. Um, so just check it out. And uh, today we are also uh, releasing new stickers. So this is gonna be this is gonna be interesting. Uh, Sebastiano, uh, it took a moment to come up with the perfect design for the new invalidate caches and the restart uh, stickers. You can find them on uh, on our uh, on our website. Uh, and they are they are very cool. You just uh, can get them for like a handful of euros. They are gonna be shipped with priority mail, so we are trying to keep uh, the the cost uh, low, but you know improve a bit the 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 shipping. So uh, we don't have trade king, but we know when the delivery has been done. So at least we know that the stickers arrived. So it's 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 something. Just uh, so just on that topic, I would like to say. They always arrived. We haven't lost any. They yeah. might take time. So be patient. It's, you will get yes. them eventually. It's uh, it's slow, but it's reliable. So just just hang in there. 
and and then, as usual um during the stream we are gonna do some uh giveaway the usual giveaway that we have for the angry pizza stickers uh, that you can buy or you can win for free you can also win adam was a big fan because eventually he got the the <laughs> the, the the hollow one the hollow sticker is only available for our supporters uh, if they win the giveaway so just keep an eye on the chat and um and this is it. I mean, do, you can become a supporter in a, in a couple of uh, different ways. Uh, you can become a supporter for free if you have an Amazon Prime subscription, uh, because you can connect it to Twitch, and Twitch then gives you a one-month uh, free subscription every month, basically. So you can subscribe to our channel for free, and you support the, the shipping of, uh, and the delivery of the stickers. Or you can go to coffee and you can pick one of the tiers that we have. You can support, uh, just look it up. We have a lot of perks, different perks, different tiers. Uh, pick the one that feels uh, good to you. And, and thank you for the for the support. And yeah. Oh, I, I also got a bunch of IntelliJ Kotlin JetBrain stickers today. So this is gonna be this is gonna be fun. The next person that wins. Uh, the giveaway is gonna have like a, a nice a nice bunch of uh, stickers today. So thank you very much, Adam, for donating a sub. Thank you, thank you, thank, thank you. you. Okay, what are we talking about today, Sebastiano? Well, you shouldn't ask me. You should ask the person who's gonna get trolled. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. The, the thing that I know, in, in, in the last episode, uh, we talked about Bezier. I might have gone slightly on a tangent last time, <laughs> but it okay, was fun. So, I had a lot of fun. Uh, last week, okay, let, let's put it differently. Last week, we released our first After Effects workshop. <laughs> uh, by, by Sebastiano, uh, we started to, oh, how do we do this in Compose? And Sebastiano just went to like, oh, you should buy this shit from Adobe. And it was like, okay, I mean, let's we all with it. Uh, but jokes aside, it was a nice episode. I, I, there was a lot of information for somebody that is not into animation like myself. Um, so thank you. But now we are doubling down on this stuff. <laughs> so Mark, what are we doing today? <laughs> Well, this was kind of inspired by uh, a comment that um, someone called Code in the uh, the Telegram chat made, saying, two things I will never understand in Android, easing curves and uh, SVG path data in vectors. So we decided to make it happen, and we're going to be talking SVG path data, and we'll uh, go through how to uh, draw shapes uh, in vector drawables. Um, technically speaking, you don't need to do this because if you've got um, tools like Sketch and things like that, they can create the SVG path data for you. But where it's useful to know this stuff is when it comes to animating things. You can only animate the commands if you can understand them. So that's why we're going to go through the drawing basics. And uh, yeah, we can... Uh, I've got some other stuff we can share. Um, I've spoken about this on a few occasions, um, so uh, we'll we'll get to that as uh, as and when. Um, but yeah, um, shall we dive in? Yes, please. Because I don't know any, nothing about this shit. <laughs> so I was like, please, please. Let me know when you want me to share your screen. Is yeah, this... if you could share my screen. We Your screen is shared. Oh. So this is a basic uh, vector drawable. Um, there's not a lot here yet, and it doesn't do anything. Um, so I've just set up a template. Um, what we have at the outer level is the vector element. And this kind of encapsulates everything and says, this is a vector drawable. Um, and inside here, you have two widths and heights. You have a normal width and height, and you have a viewport width and height. Now, this sort of seems a little bit confusing at first, but 
it's really quite useful because the width and height is what it tells the outside world its size is. So when you've got this inside an image view or something like that, during the measurement pass, this will say, I'm 32 by 32 dp. Um, vectors are scalable. So uh, this will, uh, in a, um, a wrap content scenario, this will dictate the size. But if you override it in a layout file or in Compose, then uh, it will scale to whatever size you want. And these things are still very relevant in Compose land. Uh, they've not gone anywhere. You can still use um, vectors as your, your painter resource for, for your images. So you can still use these a lot. They're very useful. So okay, that's... So, we, sorry, sorry. We, we then hide are the, the size if you use wrap content. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. So we then hide our, the, the dimensions if you use wrap content, okay? Yeah. Uh, that's, it's what, that's okay. It's where during the, the, the measurement pass, the, the layout, the constraint layout, or the linear layout, or whatever, says to the child, how big are you? It's going to report that back as its size. So where you're using wrap content, that's the size it will use. But you can override it in the layout XML or uh, by setting widths and heights in, in Compose on the, the image object, uh, your image composable. OK. Now, the viewport width and height is kind of the internal size. This is the dimensions of the canvas you're going to draw on. Um, so this is completely independent of the width and height but it will be scaled so it's important to match the aspect ratio so here i've got width and height of 32 dp and the viewport width and height of 64 dp so it's a two to one mapping um but this is arbitrary you can use whatever viewport width and height is it makes it easy to do the maths that we're going to be looking at so I usually try and use uh, a value that is um, divisible by eight because, you know, or, or it's a, a, a power of two um, because when you're dividing things in half and half, and it, again, it just makes life so much easier if you're having to deal in integers rather than going into to floating point. So... For example, if I was to set 100, 100 here, the halfway point would be at 50. The quarter point would be at 25. The eighth point will be at 12 and a half. So it, you're starting dealing with fractions there and it makes the maths a little bit harder uh, to model mentally. Whereas here, 64, the halfway point is 32. The quarter point is 16. The eighth point is eight then four, you know, half again. So by using powers of two here, it just makes the maths much easier. That's my personal preference, but do whatever works for you. That That's kind of the key thing. So that's the basic vector. Inside here, you have a path, and the path is basically what gets drawn. Uh, there are other two other element types that if we have time, we'll cover, but... Uh, Maybe we won't, we won't have the time to do that, but there, there's plenty of uh, information uh, on that. Here I'm setting a stroke color of white and a stroke width of two. This is going to be the, the, the thickness of a line that we're going to draw that's going to follow this path. And the thing we're going to be covering here is this path data field. That's our main focus. Path data is essentially SVG path data. Uh, and what I will do is I will just drop a link in the chat because this is the uh, the official W3.org uh, W3 documentation on this stuff. And this is effectively the reference material for what we're going to be covering. Um, but Let's not mess around. Let's just jump in and start drawing some shit. Um, so 
the first command is a move to. Now, if anyone ever used uh, Turtle Graphics when they were learning stuff, uh, like was it this, called Logo or something? Logo. Yeah. 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 Logo, man. Wow, shit. You're giving me like, wow. That was like Proust. <laughs> Proust. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so yes, please, please. So, uh, oh man, I need to find if you're familiar with that, initially you're going to get vibes of logo from this. Um, because the first command we're going to talk about is move to. What move to does is if you imagine you've got a, 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 a canvas that you're going to draw on, you want to move your pen to a given point without actually drawing anything that's where you do a move to. So this canvas on here, you can just about see a black outline in our preview here. And Seb, I hope you uh, appreciate what I called <laughs> the project. Yeah. I mean, what um, else? If you, if, you ever, if you ever need the variable, we also have that, right? <laughs> <laughs> of course. Uh, sticker. So the move to is basically going to move from the current position. So the, uh, the, the position is stateful. Every time you do something, the, you, you'll move to a new position. Whether or not you draw anything during that move or not, it depends on the, the command you're using. With move to, you're not going to draw anything. So this coordinate space is 64 by 64. Uh, you can use fractions of these if you need to, but uh, as I said earlier, it's just easily men uh, much easier mentally to, to uh, uh, work in integers. The top left corner is zero zero, and the bottom right corner is sixty four sixty four. So that's our canvas. So the first thing we do by default. Because we've done nothing, the current location is zero, zero. But we actually want to just step in from the edge. We want a, a little bit, bit of a border. So we'll give it a, a border of eight. So by doing that, we've just moved our pen from here, the origin, to about here, which is eight pixels in from the left and eight pixels in from the top. So hopefully that's fairly straightforward. But we've not drawn anything yet. So let's draw something. So the first thing we'll do is we'll draw a horizontal line. And case is important here. We'll come back to that in a moment. And we're going to draw a horizontal line that's uh, going to draw to pixel 56. So because we already know it's horizontal, we don't need to give a Y component here. We're just saying draw a horizontal line that's going to go to pixel 56. And there we get a line. Um, this is this is the part that I don't understand. I mean, how can you go to 56 plus 56 if the thing is 32 DPs? Because okay, it's, it's not, not 32 <laughs> DPs. This is the viewport we're working on. OK, so but why why do we need the view, the width and height if we have if everything is based on the viewport? Um, because the uh, the layout pass doesn't have any concept of what the viewport is. That's what we're drawing on. Um, what this is doing, is, it, it is actually really you, you can keep these the same if you want to, um, but if you want a nice big value here to keep the maths easy, but if this was just say 8 dp and this was 8 dp, you could still have this nice big viewport which gives you lots of divisions by two and keep as integers. Okay. Uh, and you're completely independent of this. So it, it's just your internal coordinate system you're defining here. And all of these values are with respect to these. And when it gets rendered, the system will render them at the correct size. Nice. Thank you. This clarified. So, yeah. Uh, I today think I learned. 
what could be helpful to think about this is that the width and the height, when you see DPs, those end up on the screen, whereas the viewport width and height are the is the size that you're working on inside of the vector. So yeah, it's the external true. size and internal size in a way. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Sorry for interrupting. By yeah. the way, uh, we have a couple of questions. I don't know if we okay. want to cover them now or later. Uh, uh, so one by the tracks and one by Fabio. Um, so the first one was, why is that the Android SVG Vector Drawable is different than the regular SVG that you can find online? Um, it's, it's kind of like a subset of the SVG standard. It uses the S SVG path data, which is kind of a subset. You, you have other ways of grouping stuff. So this is going into a, a vector path element. You have things like masks and stuff like that in um, SVG that doesn't translate directly across. You, you can do stuff like that um, with clip paths, but uh, it's kind of like we're just using a small subsection of SVG to define this uh, path language. Uh, but you can import SVGs using Android Studio, using the, the vector import tool. Um, yes. And it will do a pretty good job these days. I uh, think when they first did it, it was a bit hit and miss, but it's it's got a lot better now. The main the main reason is performance, because a lot of the things you can do with SVGs, like SVGs, I'm not saying it's Turing complete, but it kind of can get to <laughs> a point where it's essentially a programming language where you can embed stuff that comes from the internet, you can put bitmaps, you can put uh, all sorts of weird things that are not supported in uh, vector drawables because they either don't make sense on Android or they're very slow and expensive. So that's the reason. It's like just a subset that allows you to do most of the things without uh, the, the problems you would have otherwise. Uh, do we want to do the other question as well? Uh, uh, yeah. Which is talking about performance. Do you think it's better to have the same value for height and viewport height? And I guess the same for weight, uh, width and viewport width. Um, as I said, you don't have to. Um, what's important uh, is to uh, just do something that you're comfortable with. Um, that's kind of the, the key thing. Uh, use it to to uh, to make life easy for yourself. If you find it easy to keep them the same, then do that. If you find it easier to to use it like I have here and keep the viewport to uh, to uh, make the maths a lot easier and keep it as integers, then do that. But do what works for you. That's the the, the important thing. Uh, there's another thing that uh, I would add while we're talking about performance when it comes to vector drawables. Uh, so you have to consider that before the OS is able to draw them to the screen, it needs to read the path data, turn it into a, a path in the skia sense, rasterize that, and then draw it. So internally the vector will still be turned into a bitmap that's what rasterizing means so the more stuff you have into your uh, vector drawable the more time it will take to rasterize so the first time it gets to be drawn is going to be more and more expensive uh, the more stuff you have in there so that's why vector drawables for work very well for like icons and small things that don't have too much detail because uh, otherwise it would get too expensive and this like because it gets rasterized it gets rasterized at a certain size so if you're like animating the size of a vector drawable every frame it will have to rasterize it again if you're changing the size so just keep that in mind as well uh, yeah uh, as adam mentioned i think i did mention earlier it's important to keep the aspect ratio the same so the ratio between the width and the viewport width and the height and the viewpoint height need to match. So 
if you were to do something like that, it's going to distort. So you need to, to just make sure you, you keep the aspect ratios the it, same. Yeah, it sounds like something that a lint check could do for you. Yeah. Um, so the, there was another question. What do the, the alpha letters mean? These are the actual commands. So the M is the, the command move to. It's saying move the cursor without drawing anything. So in this case, we're moving to position 8-8 eight, eight on the canvas. The H is draw a horizontal line, and we're uh, drawing it to position 56. So that's over here. So move does moves to there. That's the new position. Then when we draw a line, a horizontal line, it's drawing it to there. So as well as horizontal lines, we can draw a vertical line. So we do exactly the same thing, and we get a vertical line. And there, V is the command drawer, a vertical line. So now we're going to get a little bit funky. And I'm going to use, uh, because lines aren't just horizontal and uh, vertical, they can be diagonal. So you can't always just get away with using these two. So there is the line to command, which takes an X and Y coordinate and allows you to, to draw any straight line. And as well as that, there's also, I did mention earlier that case is important. So here I'm using capitals. And what this is doing is using absolute coordinates. So this is position X56 for the horizontal line. This is position V. 56 for the vertical line. But if we now do a lowercase, this is now relative. So it's relative to the current position. So if we do minus 48, so we want to move 48 in the horizontal direction of what, uh, and reduce the value, and then zero because we don't want the vertical component, the y value, to change. And then we get the bottom of a square. So it's doing exactly the same as we could do with uh, either an H8 would do the trick, or we could do an H minus 48. Uh, no, uh, it helps if I put in H there. So they're all equivalent, but by just uh, it's just uh, useful to show the different uh, drawing primitives we have. Now, I'm sure people are guessing that we're going to draw a square here. And so the obvious thing would be to draw a vertical line back to where we start. But we can cheat. And actually, there's a really good reason for cheating. There's a command called close path. And um, what that is, is it will draw a line from the current position back to where the path started. So when I say the path, it's the first time it started drawing. So it won't go back to the move to, but it will go back to where we did the horizontal line. And we can do that just with Z. Um, and it doesn't matter about case because there's no coordinates here. So it doesn't matter whether it's uh, absolute or relative. But a really important thing about using closed path is sometimes you might get close to where you think the path started. And uh, although um, Phil has got a lot more intelligent than this, back in the day, if you didn't properly close a path up and left a small gap, if you did a flood fill in there, it would leak out and uh, cover your whole canvas. Um, the uh, vector render is a bit more intelligent than that, but I always uh, think it good practice to always close your your paths. Um, and using a Z can do that. And when we come to drawing circles and things, that can be very useful as well. So we've got a basic square there. OK, it's not very pretty, but uh, it does what it says on the tin. Um, um, 
and it's fairly easy uh, once you you understand the, the those simple commands you can put them together and you can create a much more complex shape than the, than you had so you can use this uh technique to draw most geometric shapes um you could draw triangles you can draw uh, rhombuses you can draw stars you can draw octagons dodecahedrons um the only thing you can't draw is a circle um uh oh you want diagonal the Ivan? crowd is requesting diagonal wait okay. wait wait before you do mark before you do let's ask Ivan how you would no <laughs> oh, but you spoiled that makes sense. it that makes sense because, because <laughs> no 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 but there was one of my the the question that i had and i was holding it uh if it was if this SVG technology had the same kind of interpolation that we saw, you know, with After Effect. I'm giving you a starting point, an ending point, and you do the the the, the stuff in between. So thank you for yeah. the the answer. <laughs> At some but, level, I guess that also has it. So closed path is really nice for for doing stuff like that, but you can do it manually if you want. So in this case, you could just draw. Uh, a, a relative line back to where we started from. Now, uh, here you'll notice we uh, don't quite marry up on the corners. The sun is going to have a stroke. You have to fix it or remove it. <laughs> so that's another reason that, that closed path is your friend is because okay. it will properly close the path and you will get a proper corner there. And uh, breathe. Everything is fine, Sebastian. Everything is fine. It's okay. It's going to be I'm, okay. I'm repeating my mantra. <laughs> It's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. So, so I knew that trigger said. Um, that's why I did it. I'm I'm trolling even there as we speak. So, <laughs> <laughs> but that that does perfectly demonstrate the value of closed path. So let's get um, a bit funkier. Now I will prep some stuff here uh, just because it will make the explanation easier as we go. So we're going to start talking Beziers. So, Yay! Uh, Seb <laughs> will be even happier now. Um, so you can do Beziers in uh, SVG, and it's uh, relatively easy. Um, so what we can do is we can start with, let's do a move to, to just move to our usual 8 by 8 offset. We're going to start with a quadratic Bezier. Um, a Bezier naming is slightly counterintuitive because the name refers to the underlying mathematical equation. Um, and cubic Beziers have more control points than a quadratic Bezier. Now, three means uh, cubic is usually cubed, a quadratic usually implies four so you would think there were more control points for a quadratic bezier than a cubic bezier but it's not it's the other way around it's it's just the mathematical function being used so a cubic bezier you define using the q command and you give it two points you need to give it the control point which in this case will make 32 32 and then the end point which we're going to make 8.56. And we nice. have this. Um, now, to understand how this curve is being created, let's uncomment this stuff. So I'm drawing uh, a dot. Uh, let's properly terminate that. Here, which is this control point. And so when the curve starts, it's going to head directly towards the control point. But as it progresses uh, towards the end, it's going to head directly away from the control point. And at each point in between, the uh, start and end point are going to have uh, a different bias on the direction. So if you can imagine that if you uh, draw a line on there, as the, from zero to one, where that is 
during the, the length of the code draw, curve drawing and do the same from the control point to the end point, you'll get two dots, one that moves to there and another one that moves to there. If you dr connect those up, that will be the tangent of the curve at that point. So if you draw a dot along that line that start goes from the start to the finish, that's effectively the path that this curve is going to draw. There is a simpler form of this where that comes in when you're actually chaining these together. So you can just give, so you draw an initial uh, SVG like this, uh, and then you could, let me just remind myself, because this is going to be uh, possibly go off the off the canvas. Um, so it's the quad. So we can do. So the relative. Uh, sorry, the, there's a shorthand smooth uh, Bezier. So if we go, say, from there, so this is T and we just go to, I don't know, maybe 8, 32. Yeah, that's not great. <laughs> uh, it's gone off to the canvas. So, uh, uh, let's go 45. No, it's still gone off the canvas. Um, okay, let's go. Uh, yeah, I didn't think this through. Um, what this is effectively doing, uh, let me actually do something like this. If I re increase that and then go 128, that's kind of better. Still going off the screen, so let's go maybe no. Kinda you, you can see what it's basically gonna do, it's gonna position uh the control point between these two lines. Actually, let's go something like sixty-two there. Yeah, that, that's kinda better. What it's actually doing is you're only just giving this the end point and it's working out the control point by basically mirroring uh, this. So at the end point of the first line, it's going to work out the angle and distance of the control point and infer that and put it in automatically for you. So it will create a smooth transition through that point. So if we were to do, say, another one that's going to go where should we go? Let's go 48 and go to 48. Uh, uh, let's go 62 again. So you kind of. Uh, So yeah, the second one, it's going from there and it's mirroring that. So you're going to get this curve. So you're just drawing a series of dots and it's going to create a smooth curve between them. So that's certainly usable, but, uh, you, you know, and there, there may be times where that's useful, but personally, I find it easier to use the longer form so that you can manually tweak that um uh that control point but if you just want a smooth transition you can use the short form um and that's uh, that's pretty nice too but i don't tend to use the short form much uh, because uh, i find it a bit trickier um to, to get my head around as you could see how i was struggling to stay in the the canvas while i was doing it so yeah i'm surprised seb wasn't trolling me there quite mercilessly because i probably deserved it um I am too gracious of a host. <laughs> <laughs> so we can move on from there. Um, and we can go on to cubic Beziers, um, which uh, 
again, I've got some stuff in there to help understand them. Um, so let's first of all do a move to. Um, so this is very, very similar. Um, that is, yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, uh, Cubic Bezier, for those that didn't watch last week and uh, got Seb's explanation, it's kind of similar, but rather than the single control point, you actually have two independent control points, one for uh, that affects the start, one that affects uh, the end. Uh, so let's just dive in and do one. So a cubic Bezier is command C. So we start by defining the first control point, which is going to be 32, uh, 8. Then the second control point, which is 32, 56. And the end point, which is going to be 8, 56. And we get a curve like that. And as before, I drew in uh, these control points so you can see how they work. And the principle is the same. It's just that you have two control points so you can control um, the uh, the end curves. So, so there's a lot more flexibility here. You can effectively create uh, a quadratic here by actually putting these on the same point. So you don't need to use the quadratic one at all. You could do it purely using cubic Bezier's. So you can do anything with a quadratic that you can do with it. You can do with a cubic, but you can do more with a cubic. So if it's a choice between learning one or the other, learn the cubic because it just uh, does more. So I don't really think there's much more to say about that because uh, if anyone still doesn't uh, uh, understand this, go back and look at um, uh, Seb's video from last week or uh, Seb's uh, discussion about Bezier's because he likes Bezier's. I'm, I'm happy you called it discussion, not rant. <laughs> that would have also been a valid the definition for that. <laughs> but yeah, Bezier's are nice. Um, but something I certainly mentioned on the chat uh, last week was that nice as Bezier's are, uh, because of how they work, it's actually not possible to create uh, a circle, uh, a, perfect, a mathematically correct circle using Bezier's. You can approximate, you can get close, and you can get close enough to, to fool the human eye which is what most of us uh, are equipped with. Um, but uh, to do that, there is another command. And here we get a little bit funky. This is uh, takes a little explanation. So you can see how much uh, uh, visual examples I'm going to be adding in here. Um, <laughs> always a good, <laughs> always a good thing. <laughs> so the the final command really um oh i should mention just uh back on um cubic bezier's um there is a similar short form command uh so that you only uh and it is going to do so the smooth transition just like um the short form quadratic bezier and you only need to give it an endpoint and the second control point because it will infer the first one from uh, the the previous curve, uh, so you can use that as well, but it works much the same way. Uh, you just don't need to bother about the first uh, control point, and you'll get a, sm a smooth transition through the point. So anyway, arcs. So an arc is a circle, an ellipse, or a section of one. Um, so let's think about how we draw a section of um, uh, a circle. So let's first do our move to. And the first thing we want to do uh, is have 
an arc command, which is A. Now, this is the most complex one we've covered. Um, and you'll see I've already displayed two dots on the screen because this will become quite relevant to the explanation. So, uh, actually, I we the move to is wrong because we're actually going to start drawing at the top one of these dots, which is actually 64, 16. Uh, so, yeah, I'm rushing ahead. So I've actually made this canvas much wider because reasons that will become apparent. But we're basically the move to is taking us to this top pink dot. Or, uh, it's magenta if we're being uh, strictly accurate. Um, so we're starting here. The next thing we need to do is decide the radius of our circle. Now, if we were drawing an ellipse, we could have two different radii, the vertical one and the horizontal one. But for a circle, the two radii are the same. So let's do a circle for now. Doesn't draw anything yet. We've still got work to do. So I am going to fill in the next three values and come back to them because they will make more sense once we get something drawing. So now we want to specify the endpoint, which is going to be this bottom dot, which happens to be at 6448. And you can see we've drawn a section of a circle that links, that passes between these two dots. Now, for um, any two dots and a given radius, there are two possible circles that can pass through them of that radius. So let me first start by uncommenting this and we will see those two circles. They are the only two circles that could possibly, uh, I'm just going to make them zero for now. Uh, there are only two possible circles of radius 24, 24 that can pass through those two dots. And those are, are those two circles. So now it should be obvious why I've made this double wide so I could fit the two circles in. The first of these three middle parameters has absolutely no effect when it comes to circles because it's going to perform a rotation uh, based on an asymmetric uh, radius. So when the two radius values are different and we're drawing an ellipse, and I'll show you this in a moment, the second two uh, values are kind of what controls what we draw. One of these determines which of the circles we're going to draw. And the other one determines whether we're going to draw the longer portion of that circle or the short person portion. So the short distance between them or the long distance difference between them. So if I make this visible again now, and let's actually make it a bit fatter. So that white section, if I toggle that one, you can see we're toggling between the two different short sections there. And if I toggle between that, we can get that one and toggle that, we can get that one. I've never worked out how to remember which one of these quite does what. So the key thing I always do is work out roughly what I'm trying to do. And then <clears throat> I will try and play with these until I get the circle I want. Um, so you can see that with this command, just by toggling using different values, so you've got two binary values here. So there's four possible states. And you can see there's one, two, three, four possible segments that are defined by this. So that's how this path data, this arc command goes together. So you've got the two radii, the angle which will cover, the large sweep, small sweep, 
and which circle we're going to use, and finally the end point. So that's how we define a circle or a part of a circle. Now, there is a trick for actually drawing uh, a perfect circle. And let me go back here. Let's just remove these for now. Um, so here's our part of a segment. Now, one would think if we were to, we know we're starting at uh, 6416. Let's change this around a bit so that we're we're starting at um, eight offset. Uh, let's, and let's end at eight offset, and then flip this around. And rather than make this 16 and 48 if we make this 32 and this one 32 we'd expect it to draw a perfect circle there but it doesn't it does nothing um, and it doesn't matter what we do here nothing will actually draw the circle the reason for what this happened? is because the, the start and end point are exactly the same because of that, it decides it doesn't need to draw anything um, because it's going nowhere. Um, it still needs a small distance, at least, between the start and end point for this to do something. So if we were to say, draw this to 32.00001, and now we start toggling these, we might see, no, have I screwed up? Yes, I probably have. Uh, yep. ah. Mm. ah, yeah, there we go. Uh, What's that? Uh, okay, let's move that in. Uh, there we go. So we've drawn a circle, but it's actually got a very, very tiny gap um, on this edge. So when you're using this technique, it always makes sense to do a closed path because oh, yeah. uh, you enter a world of pain uh, if you, you forget that. And, you know, we saw how, how it can trigger SEB if you uh, don't get your paths closed properly. You don't want to trigger SEB. No. So that's it. They are the, the basic commands. Um, you Everyone has the variant from... Uh, relative and absolute um, positioning. And you get the, the, the variance on the Bezier's, but that's it. You can draw a lot of useful stuff just using those commands. Um, and let's do something just a, a little different. Um, so I'm going to go through this. We're, we're going to do sort of kind of a compound path here and draw something a bit more interesting by just combining some of those uh, things that we've seen. So if we start at 812, and then we draw an arc of radius four. Um, oh, and I, I just realized, let, let's go back and just look at uh, ellipses. So if we draw an ellipse, let's make that 32 <coughs> and rather than do uh, let's actually make that uh, 16 and 32 so uh, flip it upside down yeah. 
just uh, pull the top in. So this is uh, an ellipse. So it's an oval. And if we actually change this value, we can control the angle of the oval. Um, and yeah, this is going to trigger Seb again. So let's uh, pull that in bounds. Um, So we're drawing a di at a different angle. We're controlling the angle that that uh, it, we're rotating that that oval through. If we do this with a circle, we're just rotating something that's symmetrical in every single dimension, but an oval isn't. So you can change it to 45. You can change it to 90, and then it does weird stuff. Um, and I've got something weird going on. Uh, and uh, 60, does that want to be 60? Yeah, that's better. Um, but we want to push it across. No, uh, I removed the move to. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got various things you can do here that, that just control how this uh, is rendered. Um, and you can even go uh, 180. I think you have a tab of yourself. Uh, yeah, I think. I think you have a. Yes, I somehow unmuted a window that I didn't even have showing. So. <laughs> um, yeah, just like hearing yourself talking so much. <laughs> yeah, for once it was me breaking the audio, not Seb. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so yeah, there, there's loads of possibilities that you can do with uh, uh, these things, and you know, with the ellipses as well, it really increases the uh, complexity of curves that you can can uh, create. And by combining these all up, it gets even more interesting. So let's go back to this example we started. So this is something relatively simple. We're just going to draw uh, a little curve. Then we're going to draw. Uh, it needs to be an absolute. A line. Then we can draw another arc. So, and I'm using commas here. You don't have to use commas. You can use spaces instead. Uh, I prefer commas between coordinates because that make it clear that it's uh, a coordinate. Um, so not not one, and we're going to do uh, fifty six twelve, and so we've drawn another corner, and we can do an H twelve. No, that's wrong. That's a fifty two. Uh, that actually wants to be a V fifty two. And then an A four four zero zero one, and that's going to be fifty two fifty six. So um, another corner, and H twelve, and A four four zero zero one, and A fifty two. And the reason I started drawing this with the curve is so that I can finish it with a final straight line, which you can do with our old friend, Close Path. Noise. So no. one thing that I noticed is that you can actually put a space between a command and its uh, coordinates, like parameters, essentially. And yeah. it makes no difference, right? Yeah. And you can split it onto separate lines like I have here, so that they're just ignored. Um, you could put commas in between these and it, it would just completely accept them it's just expecting uh, a number of uh, numbers a given number of numbers for the a command um, and you can use space you can use comma the only thing you can't do you've got to somehow delimit 
that these are separate numbers. But you couldn't use like uh, dots or something. I mean, we're talking about purely yeah. hypothetical stuff here. Well, dot has a, its own meaning yeah. because it's a fraction. So right. if you did dot there, uh, you can do dot five and, you know, but it, it's doing, it has a separate function. But don't know if you can use semicolon. No, it doesn't like semicolon. Okay. Uh, but we found uh, we found that there we we could write a like a dex guard thing that obfuscates the <laughs> the path. <laughs> yeah, um, and one of the things that you you can do to to shrink these down is take out white space and thing stuff like this uh, if you're just trying to uh, eke out every byte, but. Um, Sometimes I think readability is more important. You also, uh, if you have uh, fractional numbers, you can also renew, uh, reduce the number of uh, digits after the dot, because then if it's shown at 24 by 24, you don't need six digits after the dot. You probably need one or two. Indeed, you can. Um, so, um, yeah, here's how you can combine different commands and you can create a more compound shape. So here's how you do a round cornered box. Um, so you should be able to work out from the numbers I've used this corner radius of this round corner box is four. Um, one thing I didn't mention at the start is I always use a stroke color and a fill color of white. Um, unless you're drawing a, a multi uh, colored uh, vector where you might need multiple, uh, you know, different colors. White is always uh, a really good standby uh, because you can actually apply a tint in your layout or using Compose. Um, and then you can tint this to your, um, uh, to your theme. Uh, applying tints is really valuable part of theming. So you define these just as a neutral color, like white, or you could use black as well. Um, and as soon as you apply a tint, uh, which sometimes will happen automatically through your theme, you get uh, these icons um, and they are tinted and they're perfectly in theme with your app. Um, and for anyone wanting to know a bit more. Uh, I've done quite a long series of blog posts on animated icons that covers not just SVG uh, path data, uh, but also um, it talks about how to animate them and stuff like that. Uh, I will share a link to that. That's a full uh, playlist of all the, the blog posts I've written. Um, and there's a lot there. So to get inspiration and to learn a bit about how you can uh, uh, animate this, take a look at that. Um, there's also, uh, I've given a couple of talks on vectors. There was one called uh, Vector All the Things. And there was another one called um, Wow, Very Vector Such Love. Um, that I will drop a link to that in the link, uh, the chat as well. Um, there, I talk about various techniques in that. And um, there's actually quite a nice uh, animated example at the end where I uh, do a transition of a uh, sun into a moon um, that I was uh, quite pleased with. Um, but there's a lot of uh, animation techniques in there. So uh, as I said at the start, while you don't necessarily always need to uh, create these vectors yourself, understanding the underlying commands can help you to, to know how to, uh, to animate things. So if we just uh, scooch back a little bit to say that where we had uh, uh, the cubic bezier, um, there's a technique used in part of the sun moon animation where we turn kind of like a, a convex shape to a, a concave shape. 
Uh, and all that is, is with the same start and end points, you just animate the control points and you can get a really nice, smooth uh, curving shape. So, yeah, if you want to see that, how that's done, that that's kind of uh, the last sort of uh, 10, 15 minutes of that talk. But the, the previous stuff sort of gives you some uh, some of the background into the techniques used there. Um, and I guess as we still got plenty of time, we can uh, show some other things that you can do, which are quite cool uh, in vectors. So um, you've got an awful lot of other commands uh, that you can use on the path. So mainly here, I've used a stroke to draw a line, but you can also uh, give it a fill color and it will fill the, the whole shape in. So that's an obvious one. You can independently adjust the alpha for the fill color and stuff like that. Uh, another interesting thing you can do is you've got uh, trim paths, which are great fun when it comes to uh, animating. So you can do a trim path start. And this basically takes a value from zero to one. And if I say 0.5, it uh, trims the first half of the path off. So it's going to start drawing halfway through that path. If I change that to 0.25, that's a quarter of the way through the path. So you can just draw a portion of this. That in isolation isn't that useful. But when it comes to animating stuff, you can actually uh, sort of draw a path in place and that uh, can be uh, really useful. You've also got trim path end, which does a similar thing, only it cuts off the end. And you also have trim path offset, which uh, allows you to draw segments so if i so what this is doing is it's drawing a, a trim path start but then it's offsetting it by 25 percent. so it's actually kind of like it's uh starting the trim path there so it would be ending there but because you're now applying this offset it's taking out this part in the middle and this can be nice for for doing spinners and things like yeah. that where you can uh, you know if you're drawing a spinning circle by tweaking the 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 trim path start and the trim path offset you can uh, uh expand and contract the section of the path that's actually being drawn as the transition progresses so these things are all really quite useful uh, you've also got another top level uh, element called group. A group is, as the name suggests, just a way of grouping uh, a load of path elements together. Now, in this case, we've only got one. But you can do things like if I was to apply uh, a translate X to this and just move it 16. It moves all of the children here. 16, so it, it's performing a translate on the whole lot. But it doesn't do anything to this path that's outside the group, and it doesn't matter whether that path. Oh, that is not what I wanted to do. So even if I move this afterwards, it still doesn't affect it. It's only if I'm having some cut and paste issues here. It's only if I drop it inside the group. It moves that. So that's quite useful for performing uh, various transformations on one or more elements. You can have a, a group just with uh, multiple paths 
uh, or a single path. And there's other things you can do in here. You can do a rotation of 30 degrees. So that's rotated the whole lot by 30 degrees. Um, and let's make it 90 degrees and it's completely gone wrong. So you'd want to change the translation there and maybe bring it further over there. And so you can really transform the stuff inside this uh, group without having to modify all, all this path data. So you want to rotate something, you can just do it with some simple translates and rotations. Uh, what else have we got in here? Um, uh, wrong one. Uh, so we can change the pivot for the rotation. We can uh, also apply a scale. So if we were to do a scale X, and make that 0 0.25, uh, uh, not 0 0.025, 0 0.25, it's going to squash it. And again, the pivot point would control where that scale is centered from and stuff like this. So you, you've got a whole heap of stuff you can do at group level. You can all also animate this stuff as well. So you can shrink things, you can uh, move things. You can scale things, you can rotate things, all just by tweaking these values, which you do from animated vectors. So an animated vector is just a way of linking animations to uh, these paths and groups. And what's also useful for that is you can name them. So we could name that one uh, to uh, please Seb. And then we could reference that from our active, uh, from our animated vector, and we can say rotate Kulo by uh, 90 degrees and stuff like that, and control that from uh, our animations, um, which is uh, fun to do. Uh, so, by the way, on the topic of animating stuff, I posted in the chat the link to Shapeshifter. Uh, which is a very useful and free tool that you can use to create uh, animated vectors. The idea is that you import an SVG or a vector drawable, and then you can animate the properties and has a timeline. It's a very, very simplified version of what we have seen last week in After Effects. So you can say, oh, you start from here, you go to here. That's the duration, that's the easing you use, and so on and so forth. So, uh... Yeah, uh, Shapeshift is a really great tool, um, as is um, there's a similar, uh, another thing that there's uh, a version of, um, uh, it's called Kyrie. It's basically a re-implementation of uh, animated uh, vectors and animated vectors, but you can actually programmatically modify the path data and stuff like that it's incredibly powerful um so let's get even more funky so let's draw a path and let's actually uh, let's go back to our original square um, and we'll do something funky with that um, because we can. <laughs> uh, so let me cut and paste to save time. So there's our original square. Uh, let's expand that. And let's also make that a fill color rather than a stroke. So we now have uh, a large white square. And the next thing we're going to look at is... Yay, the... clip paths. <laughs> so clip path is kind of similar to a path, only it does something slightly different. It doesn't take anywhere near the, uh, uh, the parameters that path does because a path draws something, uh, a clip path kind of doesn't. Um, it kind of stops you drawing stuff. It's a mask, effectively. So 
this, uh, I didn't want to use name there. I wanted to use path data. So here, if we move to 16, 16, and we draw, I don't know, an arc. Uh, let's draw a line, <laughs> maybe yeah. two of you. <laughs> yeah, let's just draw, say, a horizontal uh, 32. A vertical 32 and I'm using uh, uh, absolute uh, relative coordinates here so we want to do a horizontal minus 32 and a closed path and you see nothing happens because a clip path doesn't draw anything what it does is it defines an area of the canvas that should not be drawn to so if we move that and put it in front of here, it's only allowing drawing within that uh, inner path data. So if I take that out, we can see the square is much bigger, but with the clip path there, it's preventing it. Um, so this can be really quite useful. Um, and it you also uses stuff called fill windings, which uh, uh, should have. Why is that showing up? I'm looking for the wrong thing. Ba, ba, ba. Ah, it's filled type. Ah, uh, you're going to have to explain the field type, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just seeing if this is having any effect here. No, it's not. Um, <clears throat> so basically, fill types are define how one works out if something is inside or outside uh, the uh, the shape. So let me. Isn't uh, that the clip type on the clip path? Is there? A, no, there isn't a, a clip type on the. Oh, uh, that was maybe only on Kiri then. Yeah, so basically, um, fill windings are a way of drawing shapes. So they're slightly different to clip paths. Um, so let's take the clip path out. Uh, let me see if I have got the. I think it's fine now. <laughs> Okay, yeah, so I didn't break anything, but the codec exploded at some point, so. I couldn't cope with the vectors. Yeah, too much so. vector. <laughs> um, so let me uh, just find something that we can. Uh... Okay, let's cut and paste something in. Now, I'm not going to give an explanation of this if it works. Uh, it's big, so let me. OK. Um, yay. So we have a donut. And basically, all this is, is uh, I've actually done this using Cubics, but in this is a few years old. If I was to redo this, I would use, uh, I know I've, I've used Cubics here because um, of the technique that this uses. You need to be able to think about the direction a path is, is being drawn. Um, so, uh, in this case, if you think um, 
you've basically got two paths, one inside the other, two circles. And how does the fill work out which areas should be filled and which ones should not be filled? So if we want a donut, we want it to tell it, well, how do you know that this area should not be filled, whereas this area should be? And there's uh, these two rules. Um, they are, so you've got, uh, firstly, the even odd rule. So the even odd rule is if you take a point and you draw any line to the edge of the screen, um, how many times does it cross the path? So in this case, if we were to say start here, and we just draw a line here to the edge of the screen, we cross the path once. If we go the other direction, we go one, two, three. So we still cross it three times, but it's uh, an odd number. So uh, if it's an odd number, then the pixel should be filled. If we start here, any direction we go, we're going to cross the path twice before we hit the edge of the canvas. That's even, so it's outside the path. And that's how the even odd rule works. And where this gets interesting is there's a different type of rule that works in a different way. And so if you don't know this, so just using the even odd rule, you can draw two circles inside each other, uh, one inside the other, and you'll get a donor. Um, if you use uh, the non-zero rule, this works slightly differently because in this case, the direction of the path is important. Um, so as you cross the path, if it's going, if you're crossing it and the path is going from left to right as you cross it, you increment a counter. If it's going from right to left, you decrement the counter. And again, it's by the time you hit the edge of the screen, if it's non-zero, it's inside the path. So if you cross the path at least once. Um, and so in this case, you can actually draw exactly the same shape. Um, but using the non-zero rule, it fills, uh, it, it fills the entire shape, even though you've got the two circles drawn one inside the other. You could still get this to draw a donut, but you'd have to draw the inner circle going in the opposite direction as the outer circle. Um, and for a long time, this was actually badly broken. It just never got implemented uh, on that vectors. Uh, and uh, if I recall correctly, uh, the field type wasn't available at all for the first couple of releases, I think. Yeah, uh, it got fixed with the support library when they uh, added the support library version, um, which is you're well to use for most things, but you're going to have a slight performance hit using the support library version because it's just not able to, to use the same native code as the, the version baked into the OS. Um, I think I got that from Roma. Uh, I think that's also you cannot use the hardware acceleration. Yeah. Uh, because it's all software based because it needs to yeah. work backwards. So, yeah. So, yeah, that, that's just some of the basics. I think we've shown most of the stuff you can do in vectors. Um, we've shown all the path data commands. Um, maybe if uh, there's some interest, we could uh, animate one sometime and show how that's done. Yeah, I mean, we don't have a guest for next week. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> you can still claim that slot if you want. I'd be happy to do some uh, animated vector drawables. If I recall how to do them, because I am not sure I do. <laughs> well, I'll maybe pick an example that I've already done in my <laughs> animated icon series, and we can uh, cover one of those. And uh... and you know why that would be awesome? Because then, well, the week after that, we are off because I'm not uh, in town. But then the week after the 13th, we have Rebecca. And we're also talking about animations. This is like animations, animations, all stuff is animation, animations everywhere. Yes. It's my dream come true. <laughs>
And we're not done with animation for after Rebecca either. I'm so excited. Um, Mark, thank you very much for the explanations. Uh, it was uh, it's always very nice going through the vector doable stuff. Uh, I, I tend to forget about it, and then I have to use them again, and I'm like, ah, so that's how it worked, yes. And uh, this was a very good refresher for me. I'm, I'm sure there was a lot of uh, uh, new things that people learned as well, because uh, we went pretty in-depth, and I think we covered pretty much everything that there is with vector robots, apart from how to do the animations, but maybe we'll see it next time. Who knows? Um, so thank you again. Thanks to everyone that has joined us today. And uh, oh, there's a giveaway. Were we running it already, or is it the first time? It's the first time. Okay. I so. saved it. I saved it for the for the for the end. For those who are still we, with us, <laughs> which is not many. Yeah, but <laughs> well, I mean, it's not it's not many, but it's the it's the best. Um, so jokes aside. This episode was a bit, uh, and the the length was unsure. So you know, I was like, okay, let's try try to to wait. I didn't want to interrupt Mark. Uh, plus, I mean, we, we have people joining the the giveaway, so yep. uh, this is the this is the important part. Um, so how um, how can we animate the 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 pizza the pizza sticker? And I, I want to animate the pizza sticker that gets angry. Uh, mm, maybe we'll see it. <laughs> can we can we do that? Can we do that? Uh, uh, we yeah. can. I, I mean, we can. Uh, I'm not sure that you want to animate the whole thing because the vector is very complex. Just, it has a lot of just stuff. The, just so the what, eyes. You know, what you just... would do instead, what I would recommend doing is you would separate the parts that you animate from the parts that you don't animate and just layer the animated part on top of the static non-animated thing. You can use like a layer drawable or something like that. And then make sure that the, both the drawables are the same, have the same intrinsic size so that they line up. And then you can absolutely animate the mouth and the eyes. But yeah, there's going to be, as a tool is saying in the chat, a lot of bats. <laughs> There's going to be a lot of them. But then you, you just need to, well, you just need to animate just. the path data, which if we're going to do the AVDs episode, you're going to see how much uh, there is to that because it's not as simple as you would think it is. But I think... But, I mean, I only did something very basic uh, using shape shifter. So the how is it? It's called shape shifter. Yep. Yeah, shape shifter. Uh, and we were animating, you know, s small icons. I was doing it with Mario Bodeman. Do you do you remember Mario when I when, when I was in Berlin? Um, and so yeah, but I didn't understand shit. I mean, he was more like the the, the person doing the, the 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 thing. I was just a, a spectator as usual. Um. And so I would say let's wrap this up because then we have to do the um, thumbnail. Yes. Yeah. Thumbnail. Just as That's a reminder, it. if you are a Twitch subscriber or if you are a supporter on Coffee, first of all, thank you. Second of all, if you are a supporter on Coffee on the Bruschetta tier and higher. You also get access to our Discord, where we put the link for the meet call, where you can talk with the guest after the show is done. Is there's like a 15, 20 minutes after show, where we talk, we make a um, the the clickbaity thumbnail that you see on uh, on YouTube after um, after we release things on YouTube. Uh, it's a lot of fun generally. I I love it. I also have something to show people that are going to join now because I've I've been working on something uh, while Mark was animating, well, was designing curves. I was also designing curves. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> and um, I'm going to show you. They, they don't know. Well, they don't know. 
damn it i'm too bad at this well anyway it's reversed it's very complicated uh they don't know and we're they're gonna find out just as you do so thank you again we'll see you next week we'll let you know on the usual channels on telegram and on our twitter account what the topic will be as soon as possible and then we're gonna see you there so thank you again for joining everyone have a great one Ciao, ciao. Bye. Ciao, ciao.